Today we are going to talk about the book, The Culture Map, or The Culture Code, as you wrote it in notes, but I hope it's still The Culture Map. <laughs> that might be interesting. <laughs> Wait, man. Jeez. Hello. Hey. Here we go again. Uh, this is once again episode number 16 of my weekly cast, and we are discussing book called Culture Map with our hosts, that is you. I'm Slava Rudinsky, and you are? And I am Dima Valenko. All right. And this time <laughs> we are discussing the culture code. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's... <laughs> we're discussing culture map. Like, don't, don't, don't get me confused because you know how it is. Easily, I am confused. I'm just laughing at the notes because in the book the name is still culture, culture code. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, the I notes didn't... themselves are about culture map. <laughs> right, 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 right. The notes are about the culture map, and and like as as always with book club episodes, we start with the question: Why? And since you brought this book uh, into our consideration, like, would you mind telling us why yeah, you were so interested? Be before I do, we do have a short follow-up, I believe. Oh, we do. Well, yes. Well, it's not, not Technically, this is not a follow-up, but just a public service announcement, maybe a little bit. Uh, you can now subscribe to our podcast on Spotify. The link will be in show notes. Which is kind of weird, right? Because if you know where the show notes are, you probably are already subscribed. And why do you care if it's available on Spotify? But nonetheless, you can now subscribe to our show on Spotify and tell your friends that they can do so as well. I believe just in case you're using Apple Podcasts just to listen to our podcast and everything else goes on Spotify, you can just upload it. Yeah, that's the idea. All right, so the culture map then. This book has been following me for years now, and I've heard references and recommendations about it in multiple different mm -hmm. ways and from different people, but it never occurred to me to read it until my colleague Alexei Kavlenka suggested that we read it for the book club. And I listened to the first version of the audiobook, and it seemed really nice, and I like their PDF attachment that goes to the audiobook. And I thought, hmm, that might be a topic. Moreover, it multiplied by the fact that I missed that book club. <laughs> I had an important incoming meeting exactly that hour, so I couldn't go to that discussion. I thought, hmm, we should definitely do another one. Yep, I said, it's, it's interesting how... Over the years or months, or I don't know, like what what was the, what was the period of time? But we became member of multiple different book clubs, like book club of our own, and also like book clubs in our workplaces, which is really a nice thing, I think. I believe there was even a book club around by weekly with some listeners and just the right. community. Right, right, right. right Good right. old times. So. Let's start with the general question. Uh, what's your overall expression of this book? I I liked it, and I think given given my my mistake, like right, I I just read or listened to the the other book, the culture culture code, and this book, the culture map, had a bit of a contrast to me with, with that with that with that other book and many other books that, that that we read in a sense that I felt um like this is more of a complementary book in and I'll, I'll try to to explain that Th this book I felt is kind of building on my understanding and, and knowledge like it adds something to to what I already observed and what I already knew or maybe what I already thought thought about in a way that was not contradictory because uh with with some other books like the culture code i read or uh, maybe with start with why which we always often use as an example um i uh, tend to think of those books as contradictory books and uh, the books which you learn from not because they add something to to your understanding but rather they pose arguments and 
you try to refine and better define your own position and your own arguments about about certain things. So like th- this book is not contradictory book for me, but uh, complementary, which I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's quite a fair description. I also enjoyed it and I find it useful. So I would definitely recommend people reading it. The only thing that was kind of conflicting with my perception of this topic is that culture was mostly used in ethnical context. <laughs> and every time there was this like French, German, Japanese, whatever nation was mentioned, uh, I had this little cringe like, mm, maybe, maybe you should say Bob, but not, not Japanese people in, and Bob as standard Japanese guy. Mm. Apart from that, the scales, the examples, I really like the balance of uh, being rational and intuitive. There was a bit of storytelling, there were conclusions, the structure of the book was quite self-explicit, and I enjoy Erin's style in general. So there were little minor twitches that I didn't like, but generally it was a good listen and a good read. Yep, I, I agree that there were quirks here and there, but overall the, the book, at least for me, it went really, really smoothly. And to, I agree with, with your point that it maybe was a little bit of, over, there was a bit of over-indexing of this nationality or national affinity for for, for people. But uh, still, still to, to her credit, she, in, in the prephrase or in initial section of the book, she mentioned that right there are other aspects of like what goes on with culture and communication and so on. We are focusing on this aspect now, and also in the end, she also like once again mentioned the same thing. I, think, uh, I would appreciate it if there was more exploration of the connection between the two, like the, the personal peculiarities and stuff like that, and national uh, traditions or 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 culture styles, but still it, it didn't really get in the way of getting uh, useful um, information from the book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is fair. Uh, anything else on the top level before we go into the details? I think one, one interesting book, uh, uh, one interesting thing, once again, maybe as a contrast to, to, the, to the book I just listened a, a week ago or something like The Culture Code, which was similar to, like I think, Hyperfocus and some of the other books we read that had multiple, multiple and very precise references to scientific or scientific-like research when things get better by 35 percentage points and stuff and stuff like that i i noticed that in this book even though there were references to to research they were very subtle and definitely i don't think there was an even a single place where she referenced to percentages and she was very cautious of saying like like research shows that people are more likely or like like something very vague and, and, and cautious. And I also thought that it was, it was interesting. In some places, it was a bit irritating about the historical preconditions because explaining how some things were shaped seemed a bit artificial to me, but it was not the reason not to believe in the thing itself. Like I, I could doubt premises, mm-hmm. but still the idea that was above them was solid. And and she also gave quite quite a lot of like, specific examples for either from her practice or from the practice of her clients. Do do you think that that there might be um, a bit of um, kind of taking a an accident for a rule kind of thing? Because right, th- there was no research, like th- there was no comparison of this and that, uh, like A B testing and, and, and stuff like that. Do you think that there? can be a little bit of like taking like accident for for a rule and building assumptions or building a conclusions that are too far reaching on on her part you know i think erin within the book mentioned multiple times that she was talking to groups of people at different sorts of training challenging how they see their culture and what they think of their culture in terms of business and by different scales. So I think as a cross-cultural expert, she tends to synthesize her experience from multiple groups and multiple cultures. And as a representation of her experience, there is not much to doubt. I would potentially 
discuss one of the scales, but I believe we can do it later on as we go into the structure of the book and discuss the details. I guess maybe maybe to, to summarize this uh, the, this part of our our discussion, I, th- I think it, the, the way that the book was more empirical rather than trying to interpret or synthesize on top of scientific research made it a little bit more honest, at least in 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 my eyes, in the sense that she she doesn't she didn't try to say that no, this is the the, the truth, the scientific like evidence and stuff like that. Like she's saying, like this is what I observed, this is what I think where this is coming from, and this is how I think we can deal with situations that arise from from different circumstances, which um, I think is a very very fair and honest way of approaching uh, this kind of subject. So if you are 10 minutes into this episode and you haven't turned off, you probably either have listened or read to this book, or you're just a very curious person. In case you're the latter, uh, we should probably give you the outline of the book itself, because Erin introduces her scales in terms of cross-cultural communication, and not just communication, but generally cross-cultural interactions. Right. And the scales are the way people communicate, the way people give feedback, mostly negative persuasion scale, leading scale, deciding scale, trusting scale, disagreeing scale, and scheduling scales. And one of the overall ideas that, depending on how many different people you have on the scale, it's not only important where they are on the absolute scale, but also what is their relation to each other like how are they located relating to each other for instance in the communication the first type of scale there is low context and high context but there is always somebody who is lower and somebody who is higher and then ones who think about lower they have some sort of stereotypes and so on so the idea there is that you could potentially apply it not just to ethnical cultures, but you could just use the same scale system for just the team of people from the same ethnical background, but who come from different families, uh, maybe universities. Somebody was more engineering minded, somebody was more mm, natural science or humanitarian minded. I don't know. I think the idea of scales is quite appealing, at least to me. Right. I think that that's probably one one of the most powerful ideas of, of of this book that for as you as you said for interactions between within or between groups of people and introduces those scales or dimensions and then asks people to place themselves or their culture on, on the axis of those uh, of the dimension between uh, between the the extremes that are defined for for that scale and thus create a map that helps understanding how what 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 are the potential pitfalls in communicating between people with different kind of presuppositions for for behavior or interacting with with other people and this is where i thought maybe it's even better to rename it from culture map to something like culture compass because In fact, it's not just a map, map where you know the right answers. The Japanese people are here, the engineers are here, and the designers are over there on the scale. But rather, this is always, like there are some poles, yeah, or Mm -hmm. extremes. And in between these extremes, you can see your direction or your current location, the location of another person, comparing to these like extreme absolute poles, like in communication, it's low context and high context poles. Right, but I think maybe they thought that culture map kind of sounds kind of better. It does. It does. I wouldn't buy a, a culture compass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so true. So true. All right. So I think that the first scale about uh, communication is kind of most popular. Like whenever I hear about cross-cultural communication, high and low context kind of happens to be the most explained thing that mm-hmm. people tend to be very to the point and task based or people tend to be wordy expressive emotional storytelling and let, let's just say wordy uh, and the, these are two extremes and all the cultures are somewhere in between right but then i guess th- this this was the first thing where it Kind of occurred to me that hey, are we are we really looking at national 
differences as much as like personality traits because i i think i know people from the same national with the same national background which would have very different styles of communicating some would be very direct that is like low context they would tell tell you the the whole story well not not necessarily the story like because the story is more on, on the high context i guess side but to be be very specific and and clear about the thing happening right now but then other people from from the same seemingly same background would be very windy and roundabouty about explaining things especially if, if it comes to uh asking for something or asking for help they 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 would not be as direct um with, with their requests it is fair and i, I think once again when we think about cross cultural communication we probably try to make it more practical and uh, let's say if you compare most of engineers from the us you know and most of engineers from ukraine you know there is certain stereotype about ukrainian engineers and american engineers but mm-hmm. then when you look deeper let's say just in the ukrainian tech industry you would say like yeah, there are like QA engineers and developers, and they are probably a bit different in the way they communicate. And then you look deeper and you say, well, developers of this stack and of that stack might also behave a bit differently. And then you go deeper into this team and you say, oh, I think that this team that works on this project tends to be more task based and this is more relationship based and they they tend to talk more and discuss more and their meetings are more mm, expressive and longer than the other team. And then you go into the team and you say that Carl is just more low context than Bob. And then sometimes you just look into Bob himself and you say that Tuesdays are low context days and Fridays are (laughs) high context days for Bob. And when you take him out of work, like he just turns into a different person. Right. Uh, I cannot disagree with that. Uh, that, that that's very, very true. Uh, that, that's something that I kept in mind throughout the, the entire book, that even with, with the particular, the communicate, communicating in general just does not provide enough dimensions of how, uh, which can trigger different behavior in in in, in people and we, we probably will have some some examples later for for late later chapters but you're right in in certain situations you i would use high context uh, kind of style of communication with people when i well mistakenly mistakenly or unmistakenly know that or think that i can rely on people understanding certain certain parts and i can probably leverage that but in some other situations i would try to be as low context as i um as i can be and even even in in work like i want the descriptions of system design to be as low context as 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 possible like if if there are assumptions about stuff like write them down to to make this uh, the delivery of the of the message low context but in, in some other situations i myself can be uh, high context as well that is true so i think that how high context low context is not as interesting as the other scale so i wouldn't stop here for a while and yeah. i think we could just move on to the evaluating scale which is basically the negative feedback scale based on the book there's not much other evaluation apart from just addressing some corrective feedback mm. would you say you're a direct negative feedback or indirect negative feedback person I don't know, may I say that I'm in the middle or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, like, are you in the middle leaning towards direct negative or indirect negative feedback? I think, and that, that, that once again kind of has is a function of time for me, uh, I guess. I would, I think I would tend to start with a bit of indirect negative feedback and then if it's not working or not bringing results that i want i would start being more direct but also depending on the situation i may like be very direct and say like 
no, it's not going to fly. These are the reasons why this is how I think it can be made better or different. Or here are additional considerations which play a role here, which you may have missed or something, something like that. I, I would really you. love to see that sometime because based on my experience of interaction, you're quite an indirect negative feedback provider. And whenever people gave direct negative feedback to you, like let's say I was just passing the screenshots or doing something, I think it was quite mm, emotional. Like mm -hmm. it was offending. And uh, I, I would sometimes even just choose to retell you the message with my own words just to explain the context and provide some ideas and maybe not use the words the person would use. But again, it's quite relative because I do know people who are very indirect, like my partner Alexei mm -hmm. Kavalenka is extremely indirect. And if we compare you two, then of course you're a super direct person and I can tell you anything I don't like and you will most likely take it without being too reactive and emotional about it. Right. Uh, another thing which kind of struck me with, with this with this scale um, was that in a sense you can see providing feedback as a part of communication in in general right and i, th I think arian also in in her description of this thing that she says that hey there are peculiar situations when the culture can be like high context which would probably imply indirect negative feedback but instead to your surprise you would fi find that the, in general they're high context but with feedback they tend to be very very direct and just looking at overall communication style can be mis misleading and i thought that this was a very kind of interesting and powerful idea and, and what what i think makes this book uh, very practical in in a sense that it focuses on specific important parts of work related related communication and like switching from communicating in general to how people tend to provide negative feedback was very very helpful that is true and i also enjoyed the example about the us mm -hmm. that generally the communication is low context but the feedback there is quite indirect and it really corresponds to my experience with my team because we do have some Americans and uh, foreigners around the United States on board. And it seems to be a problem for my team leads to sometimes communicate corrective feedback indirectly enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be a source of tensions and uh, misunderstandings time to time, even though uh, I, I think that's part of this like paradox that we normally see that our American colleagues are very direct in most other situations. Like they are direct in talking about their personal life, about what they see around, about their opinions, quite strong opinions sometimes, and very mm -hmm. direct opinions about multiple things, but not about their own work. And that's kind of, I don't know, would you say something that doesn't match or meet your expectations. Like you, you mm -hmm. would assume that people who are so direct and love saying things the way they are would prefer direct feedback. It just seems natural and intuitive, but then no, counterintuitive was the word I was looking for. All right. Yeah, I think th th that's interesting. And, and here I was also, uh, I, I share the same impression about uh, like uh, American American culture. And my, my explanation for that, I'm, I'm not sure if Aaron offered any any kind of explanation and my thinking of the dynamics of the situation is that like Americans or like pe people in UK because I think UK is quite similar to to to, to the US in in this regard is that with feedback we try to change person's behavior and it it may be that the the culture is that the the change in behavior should come from like from from within it is you changing your behavior because you decided so and it it is kind of perceived as being respectful if you allow the other person the agency over over their behavior and therefore you provide indirect feedback so that they can internalize it 
process it first and then change their behavior rather than like slamming them and saying like no you, you, you kind of do do this where the change in behavior come from kind of from from outside and, and maybe this is the, this is the reason uh, why why things are are a bit different here i i think what i also enjoyed about the book in general that almost at the end of every chapter erin was given some tips for people who feel that they are on one side of scale mm-hmm. how to communicate with the other side of scale and the idea of uh, words that make your feedback stronger and lighter was quite a revelation for me like saying uh, totally useless and slightly useless or might be useless yeah. maybe um, in a bit like yeah can be a bit useless perhaps i guess <laughs> oh, right 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 and uh one one other thing here was uh, like again with 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 these words how, how did she call them like um amplifiers and deamplifiers or something something along along those lines something like that yeah. i think it 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 also is useful to think of yourself like how you provide feedback and mm-hmm. see if you are maybe overusing the 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 deamplifiers and you should stay maybe like not like four like not to click it to minus four but maybe just to minus two or something like that and also i think the the the, one of one of the ideas there was that was it here i think it was here um about the the fact that some in in some culture or cultures of for some some people it is more difficult to delineate between like themselves and their work and then when when they hear direct criticism they tend to think about this as an attack on themselves or kind of challenge to their credibility or professionalism or whatever rather than Mm -hmm. an attempt to make this particular deliverable or the work result better and i think it, it 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 is also useful to keep this thing in mind that most of the time probably people are not attacking you you personally if you are on on that side of scale where you can get they are. Uh, well um you, you'd, i think she she said that you'd better get, give people the benefit of the doubt <laughs> and I agree. maybe imply I'd, good intentions there i'd say another perspective you could take here is that Sometimes we provide feedback on specifically the level that we would like to get feedback. Mm-hmm. Like we would give correction with the same amount of directness that we would like to get it, but we would not adapt it towards how much would person like to get it, mm-hmm. how direct or indirect it should be. And, you know, being an engineer in a team of linguists kind of taught me that the way I would like to get feedback from them doesn't necessarily mean that I should give feedback in the same manner and style to my team. Right, right. That was a bit of educational discrimination from my side, sorry. All right, so <laughs> shall we move on to, to the next topic where we can discriminate people? Um... Uh, please, no. I, that, that was the most controversial scale for me, and I still doubt oh, it works. Interesting. All right. So the the next one was about persuasion, how people persuade others. And um I had questions about this one. As the the, the extremes that Erin uh, offers us that they is are principles first and applications first. With principles first, people when explaining their idea, they would describe like the th- quote unquote theory uh, behind it, like what what goes into this and then maybe show how it will be applied to to a particular situation and then on the application first they kind of start with conclusions this is how we do things this is how we would practically apply what i'm suggesting and then maybe offer a little bit of an explanation how they got there and how the idea was conceived my problem here is that i think that that's not a full scale Mm -hmm. It's more of a rational side. And if I were advising something, I would change principles first and applications first into something that is named inductive and deductive reasoning. Mm -hmm. Because basically it's a similar concept. 
But apart from that, sometimes people use another alternative persuasion skills, like emotions, mm -hmm. relationships, and uh, some other tricks and hacks that work much more effectively than both inductive and deductive systems together. It's important to be able to create arguments in both styles, but I think it's not the full description of the persuasion tool toolbox. Right. I, I, I also felt like while this is kind of important, important thing I, I think that this skill maybe that there are just more dimensions to, to how we persuade people with, within different different cultures and uh, it's like just doing this principle first versus applications first uh, is a bit of oversimplification and this is where i got a bit worried about like are individual examples treated more as an rule than, than anything else uh, she she was um offering us an example of her um teacher of russian i think where he followed to her uh, evaluation kind of controversial applications first method where he's just started talking to her in russian without building the grammar and then stuff like yeah, yeah. that and to me like this is the way how i actually learned English, like, and I think this is what helped me learn English in um, my high school in Lyceum of Information Technology in uh, in, in Dnipro, because the teacher the teacher of English like started speaking English with us from the first day, and all the explanations, including explanations of grammar, were in in English. And to me, this is more of a indication of a particular teaching method or teaching style rather than an indication of culture that goes applications first or principles first moreover it's kind of conflicting with the trust and scale which will be a bit lower where they say that if you are a relationship-based person you will most likely be convinced by another person just because you have the relationship it doesn't really mm -hmm. matter what the person is offering but if the person likes you uh, one will accept your offer and th th that's kind of conflict in here because uh, it, it wouldn't work that way if persuasion was just principles first or applications first where's the relationship in this context and mm, probably something with naming that just doesn't ring to me right. but but still i think that the, the useful the, the kernel of truth here is that people with different backgrounds might be used to different way of presentation of ideas and they would expect different arguments or different kind of maybe data or illustrations for that to that, that work better for absolutely, them and being absolutely. being aware of that can be really helpful and here i was thinking much you already mentioned that uh, the dimension can be not only the nationality but the occupation of a, of a person and i'm thinking that she she, of, she said that in Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, uh, the people are used to dialectic thinking with thesis and the thesis and synthesis as a method of presentation of ideas. I would think that maybe this is more common for people with background or education in sciences and maybe not as common for people with uh, background in humanities and that they may be used to different methods of introduction on, on uh, and argumentation I, I guess i would agree hmm anything else about persuading or we can just jump to yeah i think scale. we can move ne next one was about leading leading and dima do you find yourself being an egalitarian or hierarchical leader once again can, can i elect to be both i think and then i will uh, ask you once again would you be leaning from the middle towards egalitarian or hierarchical i guess uh, Aaron also i think alluded to, to this idea that people think and when they say about themselves that they want to be egalitarian but in fact when it comes to actually doing and leading or like in in real world situations then they tend to be more hierarchical i guess that's maybe i'm um i'm <laughs> would be a representative sample of this idea 
I guess so am I. I I would purposely highlight some examples like LND community through PM and conference and some other places where I would create egalitarian systems. Mm-hmm. And then I would ignore some other examples where I would shape the teams or projects where it was very hierarchical. Oh, not very, very. I mean, like if you compare us to the Ukrainian army, then pff, we're quite egalitarian, all of us. But if we compare ourselves to, let's say, an NGO in Brussels that does some ecological mm, projects across the world, then we are quite hierarchical. And it is hard to judge. But we do judge people who lead in a very different style from us. And I can see a lot of conflicts in such situations where people expect more guidance or more freedom within a project or a team. And then it's kind of hard for them to communicate what doesn't work for them. So they tend to um, direct it to a person who is the leader. Like this guy is too strict. This guy Mm -hmm. is too soft or whatever. Like we just switch to the personality rather than use this fancy words like egalitarian and hierarchical. Yeah, or or too disconnected or something, something like this. And I think this probably was the first place in the book when she referenced to some sort of research and I think the, this leading kind of um, scale came out of her thinking or maybe trying to apply the power distance research by one of the psychologists. Psychologists. I, I I don't remember his name. I'm, I'm I'm sorry. And she adapted that that idea. I think here here she's talking about this that power distance. How how big is the distance between like levels of hierarchy in in the company? And she adopted uh, ever so slightly better <laughs> names and calls um, cultures or structures or societies with small power distance egalitarian and with bigger power distance hierarchical yep and to me this scale is really connected to the next one about making decisions i think that these two go hand by hand right right yep same 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 and then once again i think that it is useful to introduce this deciding scale which is more specific and focuses on a very specific behavior in a specific set of circumstances rather than just leading or the structure of society which is too general and maybe too disconnected from the reality on the ground and the overall idea is that we tend to either seek for consensus or top down decision-making model where there is a person responsible and we can have quite a lot of discussions, but then the person who is in charge will decide what what do we do. And do you think you are more a consensual or top-down decision-maker? Here, I would think I tend to start on the consensual side and when things are not converging towards something (laughs) i'll start (laughs) being a little bit more uh, top down or if the situation is like time critical where where, where time pressure is high and there's no no time to to seek for or not enough time to to seek for for real consensus and a solution is better than the best solution delivered in a week instead of now then yeah I'll, I'll tend to be more of a top-down kind of guy you know for me it was difficult to decide who i am because i really enjoy both styles but on different levels when we have to make a conceptual decision about something let's say our marketing strategy mm-hmm. i do like the consensual uh, discussions a lot of input considering multiple positions and opinions but once the decision is made And we move to the integration part, like we have to, I don't know, choose the provider, talk to the vendor, do something, launch the first campaign. I tend to go to -to top-to-down approach more. So let's say we would have to discuss the change in our company culture. That would definitely be something debatable and consensual. If something is directly in my responsibility, and let's say it's a biz dev question, like whether we should 
you know, get another subscription on Calendly or something. That would not require any consensus from anyone. Right. And I think an uh, interesting aspect of this whole discussion can be something that I don't think she touches in the book, but the idea, like, here hierarchical and top-down assumes that there is a manager or boss that kind of drives the decision, but it seems to completely omit the, the idea that even within the group of peers, there can be people who would be ready to step up and then like take the lead on, on something. And this, I also think, tends to be different uh, for, for people with, with different backgrounds, but I would not classify this as either egalitarian or hierarchical or consensual or top-down. It's just how likely people are to, to step up and take responsibility and take the lead on something, mm -hmm. even if they are not formally in a position of power. It does make sense. And I also liked your distinction about decisions with capital D and decisions with just a D about values and about tactical steps. I think uh, it really seems very similar to what I tried to explain, but probably failed. You know, I think it maybe one once again an example where just just one dimension, one scale might not be enough to describe the the richness of the, of the real world because uh, in in some and she she was saying that in some cultures people tend to treat decisions as decisions with capital D such that once the decision is made everything else is subjected to that decision and has to kind of work around or comply with that decision where versus the decision with lower how do like capital D and not capital D. How do you say it? You, you are a linguist to tell us. I am an engineer, by the way, but... Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to, to offend or to... Let's just go for a small D. Yeah, small decisions with small D, which are just a tactical thing, current best idea, and when new information comes in, we can easily change it to something, something else. I think... It's not to me. It's just not 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 just that. Not not just culture, because in different contexts, right? Like as as you said, with values for the company, that would probably be a decision with capital D, and you have to have a very good reason to to deviate from 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 that decision and move in different direction. Whereas if we choose like. Calendly or some other tool for something that's just a decision and if, if someone decided to do to go with something else because they thought it's better well, yeah, more, more power to them I guess but I do know teams that discuss even minor steps mm -hmm. together and they don't make any progress before people agree that it's a good way to approach mm -hmm. even within my team there are people who sometimes mm, let's say get unhappy with the decisions that uh, where they were not engaged in the process of decision making and th they take it just harder to take and follow afterwards mm. that, that, that's interesting i think it's it's related it, at least to me it is related to trust and how we trust or distrust other people which probably brings us to the next scale uh, which erin uh, called trusting and the, the extremes she offers is like task-based trust where I don't know like what what would would be the best way to describe this like when when you are about to sign a contract with with someone you focus on the on the wording on the agreement which you are going to sign and you you kind of trust that thing which is kind of task-based for for the project you're working on versus relationship-based trust where you first get to know the person and get to learn to trust that person and then transitively transfer that trust to whatever that person does for you or how they interact with you. Would it be a fair way to describe it? I guess. So what and do you think about it? <laughs> you kind of moved to the trust scale right now, haven't you? 
Yes, I did. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, these things are very interconnected, and sometimes it's really hard to. Uh, what would be the word when you have a system and you try to disattach it and look at different elements? De deconstruct. Deconstruct. Yeah, I, I guess deconstruct would be the the proper one. And if we look, let's say, at a median. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to deconstruct and look at it from different scales because they're all kind of there. The leading style, the trusting style, the deciding style, and uh, they are there. And what I like about Erin's book and why it is hard to answer a question, because Erin provides different examples in different contexts. Like it could be a face-to-face uh, -face interaction of two people who come from different cultures or a bigger team with people from different cultures there. And without this context, it's really hard to answer and say like, yep, I, I think it works like that or I think it doesn't work like that. So I kind of struggle to answer, sorry. Right. Uh, no, no, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, the the further down we, we go to more specific things like this trusting, disagreeing or how people arrive at, at decisions, the more difficult it is to disconnect a particular dimensions from from the rest and you like almost naturally you want to ask if someone introduces a situation like in the meeting this is this is what happened you would want to ask like was this the first time the group met together to do this kind of thing because that would give you information about like do they have any relationship based trust be between them do they have prior experience of um, knowing knowing other people and and, and so on so uh, yeah things are very very connected there you know previously i would say that my partner anya was definitely a relationship-based person because mm -hmm. when she moved in sevi she was spending lots of time setting up the relationship and i realized that i'm also kind of a relationship-based person but I wouldn't spend so much time because I believe that relationship can be shaped in progress mm -hmm. and task-based is not definitely... Uh, we can look at our example of bi-weekly. I right. think we did build up quite a strong relationship and this relationship is holding bi-weekly together for years and it didn't happen because you and I were discussing life and concepts and we were doing stuff together and we did build the relationship in the process. So... To me, that was a bit controversial because it was kind of reliant that we just do the job and that's it. And our example wouldn't fit in here because it's neither of these two. Right. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I guess may, maybe it's it's our, our culture that we would start with something which would be like, I guess, task-based. But if if the amount of interactions accumulates, it can, it does not necessarily grow into relationship built trust, but it has a very uh, high likelihood of growing into relationship uh, built uh, trust. And I think like this is what I would say I, I had, I, I used to have with, with auto mechanic back in Ukraine, because like first, uh, uh, he was suggested to me as a like, like he's a great guy but it's like half official like thing that goes on in a particular garage in a specific place in, in the city you go there and like he's very trustworthy he will do that thing that your your car needs and it will be great and when I first came to him, I was very specific, like, I need this, this thing fixed, please call me if, like, something is different, like, please, please call me. And then later on, it was like, I will, uh, I'll tell them, I need to do, it, like, next um, regular service for the car, I'll bring the car for, to him, and then he will tell me what needs to be done, and I will just take it, he will do it, and the, the car runs, runs smoothly, and that's how we went from task bait trust to relationship build based trust even though we, i don't think we discussed like our personal lives and stuff like that as much 
You know, and that's also challenging because I do have an opposite example. It's my mm. Aspen group because there we would discuss a lot of concepts and theories and it would help me build and establish trust with many of my group mates because I knew what the concepts they were operating with, how they were thinking. And this was a very useful experience in terms of seeing how it could work. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in my day-to-day -day life, I can really... It's hard to imagine that I would just spend days with a person talking about some life concepts, values, and stuff without actually doing something together so I could trust one. Because I think that the way you act quite often describes the way you think. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to see the, mm, the way it's connected, if it's congruent, if uh, what people say is how people do stuff. Or they just claim some things, and then when we get to actual work, it just doesn't connect. Right. Yeah, the cons consistency between the the deeds and the words of people are really, really important. And I think here, I I, th I tend to think of myself as more of a kind of task based trustee or, or truster i don't know what's the what's the right word for for that and i feel like i'm not spending enough um time on an effort and energy to 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 build relationship to to then leverage is not the, the right word but to to be able to to rely on the kind of relationship based uh trust i wonder how how you go about this like do you when when you come to a city, would you um, call out people and say, "Hey, I'm I'm around. Let's go for a drink or coffee or whatever it is." I think I used to do something like that, but I'm just tired and old now. <laughs> it doesn't work that way anymore. <laughs> I tend to spend time with people I know, and I, I think it's, it is the age. It is the age. I, I wouldn't go to a crazy networking event saying like, "Hey." would like to meet me here i'm open to new relationships like i'm fine thank you <laughs> like there are a few guys in different cities that i would purposely travel and meet mm -hmm. uh, rather than just post it online well it's interesting that listening to, to this book it kind of inspired or prompted me to think more about this aspect of kind of building and maintaining a relationship especially the professional kind of kind of relationships and i i think i'll i'll, I'll try to think more about uh, this and see how i can do stuff maybe differently or with um with with greater mindfulness uh, let's let's put it this way in this area to to build those relationships so that when time comes i can rely on that more and avoid be having to be like super specific on the tasks and per persuade people know that this is this is the thing to do because reasons and not this is the thing to do just because you know that i'm kind of a trustworthy person and i will not bring a bad idea for your consideration i think we should also consider whether you have enough social contacts that you trust around you because for instance you moved to london and you don't have pretty much anyone apart from your family and your team around mm -hmm. and you just start building up these connections with people who walk their dogs in the park or maybe right. people who work in some nearer shops but it's still it's it's a long way i remember when i moved from Dnipro to kiev it took me about three years to feel more or less comfortable to start meeting some acquaintances on the street and uh, feeling that i don't need purposefully develop relationships anymore Mm, and I think one thing that is kind of missing here is the role of communities. I think that clubs and communities, they can accelerate the process of uh, integration and trust building because when you join a community, it could be a cigar club or something related to sports or photography. I, I don't know, like pretty much anything um, is a really powerful tool that many people don't use, unfortunately. 
I think Aaron kind of alluded to this, like when you want to, in, in some cultures in business setting, it would almost be a prerequisite to, to first build a, at least some kind of relationship. And she said that you should be purposefully looking out for things that you have in common with with your partners to, to use them to to, to, to build to start building those relationships and of course like the natural extension of that would be just if you're interested in something go find people who are also interested in that kind of thing and i guess internet is not a bad place for for that kind of activity but so like in in real life the clubs and, and stuff like that can also be very powerful so let's Jump to the disagreeing part. No. Yeah, let, let, let's let's take that. That was very trusting. confrontational. <laughs> <laughs> right. So she says on the disagreeing part, the, the extremes are confrontational and naturally avoiding confrontation. This one was also vague for me. Like <laughs> both examples were kind of like. I really like the idea uh, that they introduced about the Asian uh, harmony concept. Mm -hmm. And I faced it a few times with my colleagues and friends from India and China that they do tend to care about harmony much more than finding the truth. But at the same time, working with engineers a lot kind of moved my vision more towards confrontational type of communication because. The only reason I see people avoid confrontation is not the cultural thing, but the language. When when they don't feel powerful enough, or they don't have the skills of reason, verbal reasoning to mm -hmm. get through the. I I can't pick the right words today. The flame of the mm -hmm. confrontation. Right. Yeah, I think. It may be related to that, but this, once again, seems to be, at, at least for me, seems something that has strong kind of personality flavor to it. I, I get it that in, in Asian culture, they may uh, be less confrontational just because of kind of the surroundings and the upbringing uh, pe people receive. But at the same, if if we move that out of the equation for 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 a little while, then w within the the rest of the uh, of the of the population, I think it, 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 at least in my experience, it is very dependent on on the personality. Because about myself, I know that I I I would definitely be on avoid confrontation side, not because I would not be contradictory or questioning or something like that it's just i feel uncomfortable when there is like a heated debate which starts spilling over into like attacking person person directly rather than the concept or idea or something something like that but on on the other hand i know people with same background like i i uh, i was uh, studying with them or i worked with them which would probably mean that they have the same cultural background but their behavior in those situations would be very very different mm -hmm. you know i i think i live in both worlds here because i love aspen dialogue and i like debates Mm -hmm. And they're very different, and I think they represent the polar approaches to the communication. And mm -hmm. I think that both things bring something useful, and it's just a method. So I was trying to find whether, for me, it's something cultural. And I think it's just not that people don't have sufficient skills to do one or the other. People who tend to argue and be confrontational, they probably lack the experience of dialogue. And people who enjoy the dialogue and don't go into confrontation, they feel uncomfortable with refutation, building arguments, improvisation. They prefer taking time to think uh, and don't interact much with others. Mm, I mean, their position doesn't interact. They do interact, but in a different way. 
Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you on on this one, and this scale and some of the others to, to me felt very much connected to the trusting scale. Is and, and in in a sense that when you, when you disagree with something, how how much can you trust the other person to actually hear you, or do you feel like no, you cannot trust them, and you have to kind of raise your voice or be confrontational just to get through to them if you can trust that you can get to them in other more let's say civilized <laughs> ways then it may kind of makes things easier well that is for me <laughs> and i think that the last scale here of scheduling was probably the least interesting because i tend to be everywhere on the scale like let's say with bi-weekly i'm pretty flexible we can mm -hmm. record anytime we'd like. It's fun. Should it be Saturday or next Saturday or this Friday or let's push a few hours later? Mm. And you seem to be that way. I'm not sure what you feel <laughs> behind this flexibility, <laughs> whether it is irritating and frustrating for you. But for me, it seems okay. Mm -hmm. While at work in managerial, like internal team uh, affairs, I seem to be in the middle, like I don't like change much, and I mm -hmm. wouldn't say I'm very flexible, but I'm not super linear. And when it comes to customer-facing activities, like calls with clients and events and something that goes up front, I'm super strict. Like <laughs> It should start exactly the time we announced it. Yeah, I think I, I'm the same here. And out of all the dimensions that Erin offered, this one seemed to be the most murkiest for me with, with even with the examples which kind of yeah, didn't quite <laughs> align with, with the whole idea but I'm very much like like, like you in this regard in some it, it, it kind of depends on, on the context where uh, in, in some contexts I can be or, or I feel really flexible and I'm not, not offended at all when, when things do not do not happen but in some other uh, even even at at work with some kind of like meetings or appointments or stuff like that i'd be like yeah, okay like can we move it here there now later oh i forgot about this meeting like th that's fine but with with some others no like it has to start start on time and especially when it comes to interaction with other other third parties i also get i I myself I try to be on time and, and do my best to, to, to arrive, not to disrupt other people's plan. And I get annoyed when people do not follow through on something that disrupts my plans as well. I agree. I agree. Uh, one of the reasons I kind of regret that this book is old, older than 2020, is that there were not many online examples. Because mm -hmm. this is where it gets more interesting. I can imagine why when you go to India, you kind of expect people to be different there. The meeting etiquette is different and the way people approach scheduling is different. But when you just schedule a Zoom meeting with a person and the person doesn't come in the first 10 to 15 minutes, you probably will just quit and go do something else. Right, right, right. And but... Okay. For somebody, it's okay to, to be late fifteen minutes, and it's fine. Like people will just do something, right? And 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 it kind of also kind of comes depends on the context and and on the commitment. If you flew to a different city to do something, right, you probably will wait for half an hour, maybe an hour, and maybe even more, just because your your flight back is in the evening and you have nothing better to do. But in in other circumstances, you would not even wait for five minutes and you just say, you're closed, like your shop is closed. The but my assumption is that people from Eastern cultures would wait. Hmm. You wouldn't. And uh, I would assume that if we, let's say, agreed for an hour meeting, somebody could actually spend an hour in Zoom alone waiting for someone to join, even for the five minutes at the end. Right. And, and this once again also comes to to the question of, of trust to me because uh, in in some situation I would I guess I would trust you to let me know that hey I cannot make this meeting even like 
one, and that two, is because three we have a different scale of respect here. Because for us, coming in time and our scheduling scale is really corresponding to how we, uh, what kind of attitude we have towards each other. And right. let's say this Eastern things about like who is older, who is more experienced, who is requesting the meeting, who should wait. Uh, for another person to join is very different from what we experience. So I, I do find it interesting, but kind of old and very narrow in terms of the context, like just for the travel part, but not mm -hmm. for the online business as we see it right now. I would really like to see the next edition of Aaron's book about scheduling. Right. And I, I also tend to think that it can be different from for people from different generations, because even like all older people who were in pre-internet, pre-smart, like pre just pre-mobile phone era, they have to be more kind of rigid with with planning. And they, like, if they agreed to be at, at a particular place at a particular time, they would make it like real effort to to get there because they they would not have a way to to notify the the other person that they are not coming or something like that. But now with smartphones, we kind of maybe feel that we have greater flexibility in with, with many of this stuff and if if you are to meet a friend and you are 15 minutes late you can just call them hey i'm 15 minutes late and you can trust that they will just go to a nearby coffee shop and get uh, a cup of coffee and they would no. still enjoy themselves my mom got a first cell phone <laughs> at the age of around 30 Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's still quite flexible with time like i think she has been before the smartphones and she, she has become even more flexible when the smartphones <laughs> jump in so I, I i'm not sure it's so generation related because we could add to our racial discrimination educational discrimination even Ages, no, no. Ages. Well, we are not saying that this is. You don't want to discriminate on this. It's just what I'm trying to suggest is this. This may be a factor that that influences how people uh, perceive, not necessarily perceive time, but perceive how flexible they can be with with certain things. And I think, like as I said, this this section was the kind of the least. Mm, kind of compelling for me the most so the, the example she gave about um, the conference where there are, there were quite a lot of attendees from Saudi Arabia which she told was on the flexible time kind of thing and they were very late for the first session on the first day but then organizers provided them very explicit feedback like no you, you should come on time like they, they introduced that this funny measure of like you you are late you pay five viewers or something like that and they were then they were on time for for the rest of the for the rest of the event and then i only have to 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 to, to question like uh does it that does the culture background really matter here so if if you communicate explicitly that what you expect people will hopefully like accommodate those expectations i'm just curious maybe we could do it uh, after the recording but what do you think if we put ourselves on these scales and see where we are because i, I think in the spoken conversation we mostly put ourselves in the middle mm -hmm. because it's but it's just safer. if we have like i don't know a one to ten scale and try to put like the way you percept me and the way you percept yourself but i will do the same and we could compare it mm, yep let's try and do that let's try and do that because i, I think this is how the scales should be used like mm -hmm. without an actual relation to whether you're ukrainian whether you're in london and whether you're an engineer i would still like to know your attitude towards most of these things and the way you see them Plus, I would like to know the way you experience my attitude towards those things, the way you see how I interact with you on these scales. Yep, let's try and do that. All right, then uh, I think it could take us some time, maybe a week or two. Right, a week or two for sure. But maybe before we close, like, what what's your general like takeaway and recommendation to our listeners um, about this book? Should they read it? If so, mm. why? I definitely think the scales are useful. I'm not sure you have to read the entire book to catch the concept. 
even after listening to our podcast, you probably got the general idea and you could just polish it with a book summary somewhere to see like the textual part. My greatest takeaway is not from this book, but it's a reminder of one event that I had with a manager from American Online who mentioned there is more than one culture. And this book was a reminder for me that the cultures are very different and diverse. And getting tools that help you expand your experience and vision of what is normal and appreciating the diversity is useful. So if you haven't read the book, I would say it's a good idea to read it. If you don't have enough time, go for a summary or just listen to this episode of Biweekly over and over and over again, about seven iterations, which is the duration of the audiobook. <laughs> That's funny. Right. And uh, as, as for me, I would also kind of recommend reading the book or at least the getting the, the gist of it. And for me, the, the biggest takeaway was that I think... I have this tendency, and I think that this is common for, for all people, we tend to think about others as ourselves. So we, we would expect people to do what we would do in, in this situation, which is not always and quite rarely true. And um, kind of being um, kind of comfortable with this fact and exploring how... Um, traditions culture or perception of other people differs from from yours and taking that into account when communicating or dealing with with other people can be uh, very very helpful helpful and very powerful and the dimensions that Arian offers i think are good starting point and the the example that from just communication in general she starts looking at specifically how we persuade people how we provide negative feedback is also very uh, useful useful idea so instead of going by stereotypes of like indians are like that or ukrainians are like something something else think about the specific situations and see how people behave in those situations and how to make it more um, I, I guess maybe more more explicit uh, what you expect and what, what you think about what other people do. And probably I would close this episode with disclaimer that Aaron mentioned that sometimes while listening to this book you might feel irritated and thinking that something else is not as effective as something that you tend to do. Mm -hmm. Like planning time like that is ineffective or Spending so much time on relationship is not effective, or indirect feedback is not effective, uh, rather than direct feedback, or something like that. And I did find myself being irritated about some of the examples in the book as I was listening. And this disclaimer was quite helpful, because this world keeps running. The countries with different managerial systems, feedback systems, scheduling systems are still there. <laughs> Their economies are blooming both hierarchical and egalitarian, both confrontational and harmonic that avoid confrontation. So this diversity lesson, no matter how much you're irritated, is useful for me. So I hope people who listen to the book will appreciate it as well. Right. I totally agree with you. I will use this as an opportunity to plug my favorite maybe favorite quote of all time but by um famous statistician like i think british statistician george box where he said all models are wrong but some models are useful and i think the the model offered in this book falls into the useful model category even if it's not perfect because all models are wrong it's definitely worth exploring and uh, thinking and would like to wish you some good weeks ahead uh, good weeks.